Today we celebrate the sanctity of life, and that's the idea that all human life is precious, holy, and, and sacred. Um, we can, there are different categories of the sanctity of life. We can talk about the elderly, we can talk about the sick, we can talk about the disabled, but I think for the most part when, when people look at the, or think of the sanctity of life, they think of the abortion issue. Now, abor the word abortion is, it can be offensive to somebody, and uh, so they pick stuff like pro-choice, women's rights, or what was popular in this last political uh, season was women's health. God considers a baby in the room, ju uh, womb just as important or as precious as a full-grown adult. He made it clear that in Genesis, we are made in the image of God. And even though the word abortion is not in the Bible, God makes it clear in Exodus that the killing of a baby of a pregnant woman is murder. In 2019 in Colorado, there were 9,000 abortions. That's reported abortions. From what I read, there are many that go unreported. Colorado is one of eight states that allows late-term abortion. A couple months ago, I was, I was driving, I was listening to, I think it was Family Life Today, and they had a ex-abortion doc on there giving his testimony. He was one of a group of docs from an OBGYN uh, group that uh, routinely did abortions. And the other docs didn't like uh, to do the late-term ones, so they mainly fell on him. And he described in graphic detail how brutal they can be. Uh, as I was preparing for this, um, I went online and typed in, what do babies do in the womb? And it, it was just fascinating, the pictures that are online there. Now, when Patty was pregnant with our kids and we had an ultrasound, um, you know, they would give you the picture, I guess, to put on your fridge. And they would say, this is your baby. Well, it looked like an ink blot. And I'm saying, Doc, I, I just don't see it. And, uh, but now the images are just so amazing. You can see the expressions on the baby's faces. And I was looking at pictures and uh, reading articles about babies with hiccups, babies um, sucking their thumb. I like the one where the, the baby would be startled every time the mother would sneeze. Uh, the babies would recognize different people's voices. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty darn interesting. Uh, and they pretty much all agree on that babies can feel pain in the womb. Now, they, they differ on when, in what point of the pregnancy they start feeling pain, but they pretty much agree that it w does feel pain. So the di disagreement is, does life begin at conception or does it begin at birth? And I, I picked a few, a few verses I'd like to read. And the first one comes from uh, Luke. And if you remember, um, Mary was pregnant with uh, Jesus, and she goes and visits her relative, I think it was her cousin, uh, Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist. And it said, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to the town of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to one, read one other, too, in Psalms, and this is probably a familiar one for you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Now you would think that this would be a topic that Christians would be unified. But I learned that there are some denomin denominations that actually support abortion. And in fact, the abortion doctor that I uh, mentioned earlier, he said that when he was performing these abortions, they were, he and his wife were attending a church, the church knew about it, and they didn't have a problem with it. So I think I learned it probably from one of the speakers from Alternatives in the past. So often uh, the mothers that go through this are so guilt-ridden 
and they feel that um, God cannot forgive them. So is abortion the unpardonable sin? By no means. Jesus does mention an unpardonable sin in Matthew, but it doesn't have anything to do with abortion. Through confession and repentance, we can all come to the cross for forgiveness. And I want to, my last verse is in Isaiah. And that's Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. What's Paul saying in Romans? All have sinned and fallen short. All means all, and that's all means. Um, I heard a lady say one time that I can't join a church with them knowing what I went through. Well, I came across this quote from Charles Morrison, and he wrote, The church is a society of sinners. It's the only society in the world that membership is based on a single qualification. The candidate shall be unworthy of membership. That's you and me. We're all sinners saved by grace, aren't we? That's the beauty of coming here. So for many years, Whispering Pines has been partnering with alternatives in, in their great outfit. And, and we just, uh, we've just made it a tradition that they come up here on this Sunday and tell us about what's going on. So I'm gonna, we're going to see a short video, and then Marissa and Dan are going to come up and tell us the exciting things that these guys are doing. Everybody hear me okay? Sounds like it. Good morning, Whispering Pines Church. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, my name is Marissa Meyer. Um, wonderful introduction, Dwayne. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm here with my life partner. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> Life partner. Like uh, husband. It's, so she's so used to the um, words that so many people <laughs> coming into alternatives uses to, to describe. Uh, this is my beautiful wife. I'm her handsome <laughs> husband. <laughs> um, so at Alternatives, I my role is the director of counseling after abortion. And so I'm very familiar with that topic. Those are the, the clients I see, but I'm, I'm very fortunate to actually be able to see all of our clients. And so I want to also offer you to a little introduction as well of what you're doing in life right now. Well, um, so a, a lot of people uh, think that they make choices, but uh, sometimes I think God prepares us for that choice. Um, it's been over 30 years since I lost my daughter to cancer. And a few years ago, I started going back to school. And I am in a biology program at CU Boulder, and I am going to be going on to become an MD, PhD, which is a medical scientist, uh, to study cancer. So uh, that's kind of uh, how God has taken something that is hard and can transform it into good. So as you saw in the video, um, and I wanted to share Alternatives theme this year, and the reason we have these mics is because we like to walk around <laughs> and talk and see everybody. Um, it's called The Reasons Why We Celebrate Life. Um, Jeremiah 29 11 is our verse for this year as we're talking about that. And we're going to, so we're going to dive into that a little bit. We're going to go into more of the context of Jeremiah. Um, and so we, I hope you guys like what we prepared for you today. Um, but I want to circle back to the video that you guys just saw. 
I want to highlight a couple of words that you saw scroll across the video. You saw the word unplanned. Four out of ten. Help her see and choose life. And I want to go back to that word unplanned. Um, as Dwayne talked about the fact of abortion, yes, I mean, it's interesting too, this last year with the election and everything going on, um, it, it's been a very emotional year. We have, we've had COVID, we had the fires rampant throughout our state and other states. And so I spent just a lot of time reflecting on the concept of unplanned. That's obviously what we see with a lot of our clients. But I wanna just do kind of a quick poll. I, I wanna make this interactive with us. And so Dan has a couple of questions because I think when we think of unplanned and I think when sometimes people think of pregnancy centers, there's a, a concept or maybe even a stereotype of the type of clients that we see. So go ahead, Dan, with some of the questions that, that we have. So. Uh, as Marissa said, this is going to be interactive, so please um, chime in. Uh, how many people here have ever had a situation in life that hit them so unexpectedly that they didn't know what to do? Yeah. Um, how many of you um, were equipped to navigate that situation right from the very beginning? What, nobody? <laughs> you know, when we start looking at the biological responses to some of these things that happen in our life and, and when these unplanned events and when these things that are seemingly beyond us hit us, uh, the process that goes through in our minds is uh, the thalamus. The thalamus is this directing center in our brain. And it, it's the thing that we get all the sensory input in, whether it's our eyes or sound or whatever, and it goes through and it says, okay, you need to go to the neocortex so that you can have a time to think about what has just occurred. But also built into us is this, and you've heard it before, fight or flight. Uh, now it's, it's been amended, it's now fight, flight, or freeze, which freeze is actually the truth. Have you ever seen the animal that you're barreling down at 60 miles an hour in the road and it's just standing there, you're, you're, you're thinking, okay, I am either gonna hit my brakes or this thing's gotta move, but really what's happened is the thalamus sends a signal when we are in this crisis situation. It sends us to this neocortex and directly to the amygdala. The amygdala is our emotional brain. This is why when I think about things that have occurred in my past, when, when everything that goes on, this is why we deal with things emotionally. So when something unplanned hits, when, when tragedy strikes, when there is something so overwhelming that we don't know what to do, the truth is, is that the way God designed us is for that signal to go directly to our emotional part, the emotional part of us. What happens with people with something that comes in unplanned is that short circuits and you can't get out of that. And so we get into depression. We get into what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? We never get out of the what should I do type of situation. Right. It's interesting because at our last church service that we went to, well, just last weekend, the pastor that was there shared that crisis precedes renewal. And I, just, I thought that was interesting because I think it's times, it's during those times of crisis that we realize actually how precious life is. You know, I think sometimes it takes God to start stirring stuff up for us to be reminded of not only who we're serving, but how we're serving. So something else, again, came up in the message, and it's the four out of ten statistic. And I know... Statistics are nice. It paints that big picture, right? It, it gives us what we sometimes want to know. But the bigger picture is this, is who makes up? Who makes up that four out of 10? And I'll say this, with the women, there's also a man that accompanies their story, right? It's not just the woman. So the four out of 10 could be your neighbor, your boss, a sister, a best friend, 
the person sitting next to you today. It could be the person that you asked to come and speak today for Sanctity of Life. I think part of why I wanted to highlight some of that information is that at Alternatives, we love to celebrate life, and we do. We sit with clients that are challenged, that don't know what to do, they feel scared, they feel overwhelmed. They feel like they have no support. And we come alongside them and we offer that support and we offer it with no judgment, without bias. And we just sit with them. We hear about what's going on in their life and what makes this pregnancy so difficult. On the other side, we get to meet with other types of clients who are very excited about being pregnant, but just need some resources. They just needed a place to go to try to get those first steps moving. And so those are the clients that we also get to rejoice with. The reason we also talked about the unplanned situation is as a counselor, I love to get people thinking about and being able to learn what it means to empathize with other people and put yourself in someone else's shoes. And so when we ask that question, have you ever found yourself in a situation where it was not expected and you didn't know what to do and you're scrambling to try to figure out how am I gonna make this work? That's how we relate with our clients because I can guarantee you nobody has ever been impervious to unplanned circumstances. And I think 2020 showed us, <laughs> showed us a lot about how that is. A lot of lives were turned upside down, things we had to get creative. But throughout all that time, the one thing that was solid was God's sovereignty. He was always there, he is always there, he will always be there. You know, I saw on your website that the pastor's going through Timothy. Uh, and so, uh, it's interesting. Before we knew that, uh, one of the verses that we looked at was 2 Timothy 1.7. You know, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, of understanding, of knowledge. See, God has given us all of these different tools. And, and um, my wife, who... Uh, has just started at Alternatives over a year and a half, two years ago as an intern as she was going through her master's degree in counseling. She didn't know that this was going to be her calling. But it is. Um, and there's a lot of reasons behind that. Um, but when we think of God not giving us a spirit of fear, We've got to remember and take a look at the landscape of the world here. You know, we have changed from being a Christian worldview to going into a secular worldview. The children that are growing up, even if they grow up into the church, they go into college and they go off on their life. And throughout life, they then suddenly have something unplanned, a pregnancy. They're, they're living within the secular worldview that we live in. And because of that... They don't have that peace of God that we have, that we can apply to the situation we're in. And that's where Alternatives comes and steps up alongside these young women who have made bad choices. Yes, I've made bad choices. I, I don't know of anybody who hasn't. And I know yet that God has come in and he has forgiven me and he has taken me from this place into this place. And as God moves, each of that number, 87% of women who have somebody come alongside of them will not choose abortion. That's what we're here for. That's what she's here for. So when I was looking at the book of Jeremiah, because again, our verse was 2911, I started reviewing and kind of refreshing myself on what the book is about. So Jeremiah is a prophet. Um, and he was wanting the people of Judah to repent because he knew what the consequences were going to be. The beginning of the book of Jeremiah talks about the calling that God had on his life to do this work. And so I started thinking, why did he care so much? And then I got to thinking in the bigger picture, why does God care so much? And so Jeremiah 1.5 reads, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. 
But I just want to pause there for a second. I mean, have you guys really taken in those words? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And I know our worship team this morning sang the song about being created in his image. I mean, it just, it gave me reason to pause when I read those words. Because it hit even more, again, why do we celebrate life? Well, we had a creator that wanted us, that knew who we were, that had plans for us before we were even thought of or <laughs> before the beginning of time. I mean, that just, it, it blows my mind, actually, when I read that. Do you guys know what the word sanctified means? And if anybody does, shout it out. Come on. <laughs> That when we ask the question, have you been in a situation that was unplanned or unexpected? We want to try to help our clients, you know, lower some of that level of anxiousness because they are, and they're in a place of vulnerability when they come in there. Again, not everybody, but a good majority of our clients. And so it's, it's a very sacred space to sit. Um, and again, it reminds me of Jeremiah. So the Lord, again, had called called him. And the, and the first um, part of Jeremiah talks about that. So I want to go a little bit further. And so, again, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and wherever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And I think that's part of why we're here today as well. Everybody has an opportunity to help out with the clients that we're talking about. But, it's too, but for those that are, I just, I want to spend on your heart for a while um, to just think about that, just as Jeremiah was called. And at first there was that hesitation of, but really, could it be me? Could you really use me for this kind of ministry? And it was. And so again, I just want to encourage you on that. You know, as humans, we will face uncertainty. We will face unplanned. As Christians, we face a certainty that he will bring us into his kingdom. Thank you for giving us the time today. And uh... I'm going to wrap up some stuff here. Um, okay. Again, I wanted to share a brief devotion. How much time do I have, Pastor Aaron? <coughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of what we've talked about, and I, I want to keep reiterating this, is so I go back to the question, why did Jeremiah care? Why, did, why does God care? I mean, I think when we, again, talk about the sanctity of life, the importance, the significance of life. You need to go back to your creator and why he cared. And that's Jeremiah 29, 11. Let me get there really quick. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, but to give you a future and a hope. That's why we celebrate, because we have a creator that wanted us, that has a future for us, that has a, that has a hope for us. I mean, I can't think of a better reason to celebrate, because I'll tell you what, I think there's a lot of people that feel unwanted, unlovable, undeserving. But when we look at things that are beyond, 
our earthly th our things, there is a creator out there. We are not here by accident. It is not random chance. You know, uh, this definitely was unplanned, what I'm about to share. Uh, it came to <laughs> mind as she was um, speaking with this, and that is a, an article I read um, maybe about six months ago, uh, and it was a psychologist that did a study in the United, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, he did a study on women that suffer from depression and anxiety in their life. And he found that over 70% of the women that suffered from depression and anxiety had gone through an abortion. So the impact, and I know you guys have been a supporter of, of alternatives for a very long time, is the impact this has on the woman who does not choose life is lifelong. And so, uh, you know, I know with uh, what Dwayne shared with, with how to, it's been women's health. And, and so we're so focused on this immediate situation of health that we forget about the mental health aspect of all of this. And, and that's what's forgotten. And that's, that's definitely what this organization has not forgotten. And every one of you who has supported alternatives in the past and are supporting them in the future, God had plans for it. He still has plans for it. And, and I know all of you have heard the story of the little kid that, you know, when, when thousands and thousands of starfish came, came washing onto shore. And that little kid was running and throwing as many into the ocean as he could. And somebody came up and he said, you can't possibly get all of this. He says, what type of difference are you going to make? And the little kid said, I made a difference to that one. And that's what you're doing through your support, through your prayers, through, through your kindness, through your contributions. You're making a difference to one. There's a devotion I wanted to share um, because, again, as we talk about the sanctity of life, I know a lot of people think about the preborn. Um, but life is all of us. It's every single one of us at every life stage that we're at. It's from the preborn all the way to your 95 year old aunt, you know, whoever. It, it's everybody. And it's also, I think, really embracing the potential of that life. All of us hold potential. And so I, I like to just, I like to take it out of maybe a box that it's been put in and to say, everybody at every stage of life is valuable and is worthy. There's a, I'll go, go ahead and share this devotion that I just felt was very appropriate. And to kind of preface it, um, the devotion before it talks about a church actually here in Colorado that set up um, people to be ready to adopt people or the orphans from Haiti. And so when I talk about this that way, at least you guys have that context. Uh, after the earthquake. Uh, oh, that, after that the earthquake. Had, yes, yes. It was after the, the big earthquake that struck Haiti that, that struck hundreds and thousands of people dead and left orphans in, in Haiti. And so... Um, this church came alongside Haiti. Thank you. Yeah. So the devotion is titled Compassion That Lives in Truth. My husband showed me his photos from the Haitian children's welcome event at our church. In every shot, attentive parents hugged their newly adopted children, looking not into the camera lens, but into their children's eyes with love and concern. The children had endured more than anybody could ever say in their Creole language. Creole language, and more than we could actually understand. For now, however, the big thing, the main thing, was that they were alive. These bright-eyed, squealing, squirming, curious babies and toddlers needed parents who recognized their struggle was not just to live, but to keep living. Their compassion, the parents, the adoptive parents, their compassion, saw not just the baby's present worth, but a child's future potential. That's what caught my eye. 
With children, true, true compassion means not just putting up with their present inconveniences, diapers, pacifiers, late nights, early mornings, but suffering with children through every stage of life. For the Haitian children, their adoptive parents didn't birth them, but their compassion was real. Thus their parenting will be too. May our compassion for others be just as undivided, just as empowered, offered not for ourselves, but for the blessing of all. I felt that God led me to that, that devotion. And then again, it's, it just, it speaks to the topic. It's, it's about the preborn life. It's about the woman, it's about the man. It's about their family. It's about the potential and the purpose that that life has, again, before it's ever born. But after it's born, it's caring for that child. So when we were talking about tonight, and I'll let Dan kind of go from here, but he brought a question to my mind. And it's, how do we honor the sanctity of life? On a day-to-day -day basis, what does that look like? If I look like a deer caught in the headlights, it's because I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. But I think the point is, is that we, I think we honor life in ways that we don't even realize it. Sometimes I think people think it has to be doing something big, but it's helping your kiddo with their homework when they get home from school. It's driving a friend to a prenatal care appointment when maybe they need help with transportation. It's caring for an aging parent. It's opening the door for people when they go to an office building. It's, it's things like that. It's the little things. It's the daily things that help keep reiterating, I think, to our culture that I value you, that I see you, that you're known. And so, again, sanctity of life for me goes outside of the walls of alternatives. Yes, that's an important place to be because that's where a lot of things start. And I'll tell you guys, when you see that ultrasound <laughs> and the mothers are nervous because they're like, is everything okay? And even when they're not so much nervous, but on the fence of, I'm not sure what to do with this pregnancy. And they see that. And then we get to go back into the counseling room and they start weeping because what they're seeing is life, undeniable life. So with that said, when we talked about how can you get involved, I wanna also leave um, just on a note of what that looks like. So again, we've talked about purpose, we've talked about what we do, what I do at work, but I also wanna talk about next steps and how do you get involved? It's one thing to talk about purpose, but then you have to put that purpose into action. And again, we know that not everybody's called for everything. That's everybody's, God will have your plan for where he wants you to be. But I'd love to share with you guys a little bit about what that can look like, at least with alternatives. Um, as I looked at our ministry goals, um, we seek to do three primary things. We want to help educate. So it's not just about sitting and listening. We want to offer information and resources and get people thinking about what their, you know, their sexual health, things that are going on in their life. Oops, sorry. Can you fix that for me? Oh, it's work. And um, their lifestyle. We seek to enable. We want people to feel the freedom to make an unhindered choice. Do we always agree with the choice? No, but it's not our place to judge. It's our place to be there with them when they make that decision. We also seek to encourage. We, so my role in the Director of Counseling After Abortion is to help them get past what Dwayne had talked about, that they feel that, that the act that they committed, that the, the option that they made has made them think that they don't have a place in the kingdom of heaven. We work through them through grief and loss, through getting past that, through not feeling stuck. 
you know, um, the shame of abortion often overwhelms. And a lot of people speak into the fact that a person who has chose to end the life of their child does not deserve to grieve. That's not true. It is not true. And that's what they teach, is that you are allowed to grieve. You made a decision in the best place that you had with all the tools that the world threw at you at that time in your life. And you now have come to realize that that is the wrong decision. But where do I go from there? Because this one has permanently affected my baby that I'll never know. And it has permanently affected me and my life. That's just the truth of it. And so the shame from the abortion keeps people from moving forward and what they could have become. And that's what Marissa comes alongside and does as well as she works people through to get beyond that shame and to allow them to grieve their loss. So a lot of these handouts are on the table out there in the in the entryway. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on is that we've really started to expand our men's support. Um, Rob Denler is the director of our men's program and he's launched what's called fatherhood mentoring. And so it, he meets with people. So it's not counseling and I like to kind of clarify that. It's, it's coaching, it's mentoring. Um, and so he's really excited. I think he has a couple of people that he's been able to start that program with. Um, because we want to also emphasize, again, this is, this is a relationship issue. It's a family issue. Things don't happen in isolation. And we want to encourage the importance of family, the importance of a healthy relationship. So we offer that. Um, and in all of these things that we do, we have different levels of volunteership that people can be interested in. But what I really want to get to is just the ways to take action. And I just want to throw some thoughts out here. One could be simply to just follow us on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, check us out. Um, also, we also offer tours. I know Sue had asked me about that. We'd love to have you guys come and see our facility. I think it's so important to connect with the place that you're offering support to. We would just, I know my coworkers would love to meet all of you. Um, another option, and this is something that our communications director came up, which I really loved. What about hosting like a tips for teens and parents night? Or hosting any kind of event where one of us comes and talks or has an open conversation with people? Um, you're welcome to invite any of our directors. Um, that would be me or Rob to come and speak to a, a, a group or a Bible study if you guys would like. So again, I think um, just in thinking about Jeremiah and the words, when he was talking with God, when he was being called to be a prophet over all of the things that were going on in the nation at the time, what is God calling you to do? What is he putting on your heart? Again, sanctity of life. It's to honor all life. All life is precious. All life is valuable. It's to be honored and respected. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me and my husband here. It's truly been an honor to be able to come and speak, especially to represent a place that I love to work. It's not a job, it's my passion. And I'm very humbled to be here and to be able to serve the clients that you guys help us support. So thank you, amen.